month and every time a different thanks um, a different organizer is going to be running the call so I'm Paige I'm based in Michigan I grew up in the metro Detroit area and now I live in the city of Detroit um, I grow some garlic here on some vacant lots near the house that I rent and I've been a field organizer at the Young Farmers Coalition for coming up on four years. Um, and I'm really excited to get to chat with you all today. Um, I want to thank Bria Baker, who is joining us to share about her new book, Rooted, which is about land theft and the history of Black and Indigenous land in the United States. Um, thank you for joining us, Bria. And we're going to get started in a minute. But first, I want to set us up with some translation. So um, thank you so much to Gabrielle, who does the translation work for many of our public events. Um, if you guys can all, regardless if you want English or Spanish translation, um, go down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see all these different icons. One of them should be a globe looking icon. It's, it should say interpretation. And you just click on that and then you can select either English or Spanish. And then click done. Cool, and maybe if I could get some like emoji reacts whenever folks are done, give people some time. And Gabrielle, if you could just let us know whenever you're all set up and ready to go. If any folks are just rolling in, we're setting up translation for the call right now. If you could go to the bottom of your screen and select the globe icon and select your, your preferred language for the day, that would be great. All right, are folks all wrapped up with that part? Anyone have questions or need help? All right, seeing some some emojis. Great. Thanks, everybody. Um, and if one of my, my fellow organizers supporting the call wouldn't mind, just drop in some of those instructions in the chat for anyone else that starts to roll in. That would be great. All right, well, before we get started today talking about Bria's book, Rooted, I just wanted to ground us in the space together um, where folks coming from all around the country, probably from all different sectors of farming, food access work, whatever it is. Um, and just wanted to ground us in the moment we're in right now. I'm sure a lot of us saw in the news yesterday that Marcellus Wallace was, um, killed by the state yesterday in Missouri after being on death row for 24 years for a crime that evidence proves he didn't commit. And um, I know a lot of folks are feeling the grief of that right now. And so I just wanted to read one of the poems that Marcellus wrote. He was a father and a poet, and he often wrote poems for other incarcerated folks. Um, he even has one, one poem that's centered around climate change and activism. So I wanted to read that poem now in his honor. So this is called the net zero morality equation. And Marcellus writes, indeed corruption does appear upon the land and sea. As a direct result of what hands have done clearly, now a question is asked and put quite simply. Is it possible to return to a state of emission free? Behold the carbon footprint and its manifest distorted body plaguing and distracting minds with self-inflicted anxiety, with a cognizant dissonant actuality, along with consumer insatiability. As the thirst for materialism borders on a global norm of insanity, proceeding by far from developed countries where bureaucracy hinders, limits, or even ignores necessary policy. 
that addresses with substance better life quality, countering with comprehensive plans to conquer greenhouse gas and fragile ecosystems. Like carbon removal and low carbon technology, innovative and sustainable solar energy, capable of running power grids to produce conscientious electricity. Embraced by a forward-thinking industry, those who partner with scholars, intellectuals, and advocate activists to bring about enhanced efficiency. Who will remind the leaders of geopolitics and geoeconomic blocks that a 2050 net zero will be an impossibility or unobtainable reality? Absent a serious commitment to uplift and assist the underdeveloped nation's people's lives and productivity and without the essential factor of a high standard of morality. Let's just take a moment to sit with Marcellus's words. All right, thank you everybody for making that space. Um, I wanna introduce you all now to Bria Baker who has been so gracious to gift us with her time and her words in this amazing book. Um, Bria Baker is a freedom fighter and a writer in that order who's been working on the front lines for over a decade. First as a student activist and now as a writer and national strategist, as a speaker and anti-racism consultant with a BA in political science from Yale University, Bria believes deeply in political imagination and the need for nuanced storytelling. Her book, Rooted, The American Legacy of Land Theft and the Modern Movement for Black Land Ownership, is about the need for reparations as an economic, racial, and environmental justice policy. I want y'all a book, too. It's got this real nice green going on. Um, and I just want to give Bria a chance to, yeah, if you want to introduce yourself further and um, talk a bit about why you wrote this book. Thank you so, so much, Paige, for that introduction and to all of y'all for having me. Um, I feel so grateful to be in community with y'all. And I was telling Paige kind of in our little, little prep call um, that it's really nice to be around people who already respect and love land and are already stewarding land um, and to like have you all enter the conversation from that place because I think we can go deeper um, versus some people I think are coming at this book from a, from a very um, earlier from a much earlier place. So just thankful to be in community with each of y'all. Um, and also really grateful that we, <laughs> excuse me, that we kind of kicked off with the, um, with the life and words of Marcellus Williams. Um, and I think it feels really fitting because my connection to land ownership and land cultivation, um, really came through my, um, my understanding of like the violence that has been used to push black people off. Um, and so I wanna honor that some of this talk is gonna be a little hard and a little heavy, um, but I hope that y'all will sit with it um, because some of us have to, right? And and there are also really beautiful parts. Um, and there's this love that has been passed down um, from my grandparents to my parents to me and that I know that it extended far beyond them. And I think, as all farmers, um, any farmers, gardeners, tenders of land should be invested in black and indigenous people having access to land. Um, I think it's something that's good for the land. It's good for us. Um, it's good for small farms. Um, and, but obviously there's a more um, personal component. So the way that I start rooted um, and the way that I um, always start talking about this book is by honoring my grandparents. And I would not have written this book without them. My grandfather passed away in 2019 and on his deathbed, one of his last words were don't sell the land. And I think it was having him feel such an emotional attachment to the land that made me feel that same connection. Because prior to that, our land in North Carolina was just the static thing for me. It was, it was a backdrop for certain core childhood memories. And it was, you know, this beautiful space that we visited, but it was not um, a space that I would say that I was invested in like protecting. And after his passing, I wanted to feel closer to him. And so I often turned to feeling closer to the land. And 
that started a series of learning and unlearning and relearning around my relationship to the land. So I grew up in New York. I am a grandchild of the Great Migration, um, but my grandparents have always been these Southern people who love the South and love being on the land. And um, I, I was trying to trace that and be like, okay, so why did it mean so much to him though that in his final moments, he wanted to, he wanted us to understand that letting go of the land would be like letting go of him. And in my research, I came to find out that my family once owned a 600 acre farm and that the first person to own land in my family was my great, great, great grandfather, Lewis Baker, um, just about a decade after the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. And so I think um, these discoveries helped me to understand like, oh, wow, this is like, understanding what it took for a black family to own acreage at that time and then to pass it on from generation to generation and still have something today it felt really um familial and really like oh this is more than just about the money right but then I'm also learning that the peak of my family's land ownership was around like the 1910s to 1930s which is true for most black americans that's when black land ownership nationwide peaked and then after that, a lot of Black families like mine saw these land holdings just chipped away at. And while they're, you know, seeing these land holdings be chipped away at, their net worth is dropping, their health income, uh, health outcomes are, are worsening. Um, and and it, there's just like this clear connect between the access you have to land, not just that's like urban land, but like land that you can grow food on, land that is that is expansive enough for you to build an industry and, and dream something for your family and have surplus. Like that was only possible in, in the South or in suburbs or in rural areas. And that was something that my grandfather really wanted us to get, that there were limitations to what we could accomplish in places like New York and that we needed to turn to our Southern roots to really know where we were and to, to be connected. So anyway, I can, I can, wax poetic and, and rant and rave about um, my ancestors all day long. But I think the most important parts were just realizing that when I first thought about black land ownership, um, I, my mind always went to dollars, dollar amounts, you know? And I think my grandparents were helping me to see that there was something a lot bigger that was being lost when black people didn't have access to land that not being able to breathe clean air and know where your food came from and, and know where your water came from and to have control over when and how you ate um, would trickle into so many other things. And um, I think they're, them helping me to see that pushed me to do this research in a, in a larger sense. I didn't want to write this book that was like, oh, Bria's family is so cool. And wow, they've had land for a long time. I really wanted it to, to be more that all Black families should have access to what my family has had access to, even though we've had to fight tooth and nail to hold access to it. And if more families did have access to land the way that mine did, I believe that it would have such far-reaching impacts on our food systems, on our public health systems, on racial wealth gaps, on all of the things. Um, and that's what Rooted ended up being. But that research really did start from just Again, my grandfather passed. I wanted to be closer to him. I started doing this research and I thought I was going to put together like a zine or something for my family, maybe like a video of interviews that I collected with his surviving siblings and my grandmother. And then it just kept turning into something that felt selfish to hold when I think there um, are so many people right now who are passionate about climate justice and have not made the next step to also connect that farming and agriculture and land ownership are a part of that fight or so many people who care about racial justice and have, have not realized that the racial justice in this country will involve um, land rights and land reclamation and, and what black people in the South and the Midwest are looking for because that's where most of us live. Um, and piecing all of that together and, and kind of helping like, okay, the, the climate activists and the racial justice activists, like they're right there. And if we can just touch our fingers, um, there's so much that we can do together. And we don't need like Silicon Valley startup ideas. Like 
we have a lot of beautiful ancestral wisdom and a lot of it is just like crop rotation, cover crops, you know, controlled burns, um, not hoarding land, not doing factory farming, not, you know, and I think that the more that we can champion these policies, but also honor the sources that they come from, honor that these are black and indigenous practices that have been fine tuned and shared and like, you know, used by so many others um, across the last se several centuries now. So that's what, anyway, I, again, I can, I can talk about this all day, um, but that's a little bit of what Rooted is. And just, um, I would say obviously that reparations is one of the biggest things that I want people to come away from Rooted thinking about. And I think that it's so important that even non-Black um, people and farmers and landowners champion this policy, that non-Indigenous people and farmers and landowners champion land back. Um, it can't just be Black people fighting for restitution for Black people and Indigenous people fighting for restitution for Indigenous people. Because the crimes against the land and the crimes against our ancestors have such far reaching impacts for all of us. So we have to all be really invested in it and understanding that there is no allyship, there's no solidarity that doesn't include addressing um, genocide and chattel slavery and Jim Crow South violence. And all of that at the core of all of that is the greed used to take land to work to happen on that land and to keep that land from people when they finally did have an opportunity to participate in the economy. So I think that, you know, acts like billions of dollars being dispatched for marginalized farmers, but being held up in federal courts because of cries of reverse racism are, are proof that we're not telling the story of what has happened to the land and what has happened to people on that land in a meaningful enough way. Because if we were, then I think we'd all be running so boldly towards it because the post-racial America that so many people um, dream of and talk of is on the other side of policies like these. And, and I don't think that it's it's a utopic um, vision. I think that we just have to actually invest in the policies that would get rid of the inequity that we know to be true. And again, anyone on this call who has access to land, who's working land, who owns land, is on the front line of seeing just how difficult it is to have land, even if you're not a Black person. Just as a young person, you understand how difficult it is to have land and knowing that there are centuries of like systems built to make it even harder for a black young person to have land or to have that land passed on from our elders. Like when my grandmother passed away um, last year, it was almost even bigger than when my grandfather passed away because now it was like a, a true um, baton pass from one generation to the next. And I think that's such a scary thing for black families because policies like heirs property laws, um, you know, greedy developers, USDA discrimination, really take advantage of black families in these moments of grief, really take away um, the assets we're trying to pass on. And so we are doing everything in our power to keep that in the family, but understanding that it shouldn't be such an individual fight. And if those of us who care about the land can speak up and say, that an injustice to the land and injustice to the original workers and tenders on this land is an injustice against all of us and is actually like a byproduct and a symptom in the same breath of, of what is so hard about food in America, what is so hard about land ownership in America, that it could be easier, that the way that people talk about Europe, um, you know, colonialism, aside. Um, I think there's there's a lot of ease that people like praise Europe for having. And in the richest country in the world, um, that should be able to, to be reaching farm laborers and workers. And I think the way that I've um, become impassioned about the intergenerational Black experience of land ownership has also really like mobilized me around other farm worker fights, especially around like immigrant farm workers and understanding that the sort of injustices and systems that were perfected against black people and black bodies then get weaponized against others. And so I see very similar things happening um, across um, the US Mexico border, across California, across Southern states. And I think that we just really need to be um, all very vigilant of and careful of 
not like depoliticizing the things that happen to people on the land. We can love the land. It's incredible. It's it's a, its own living thing. And I think it was it was important for me to even see that and to not only talk about the land as forms of economics, um, but I think that it's important for other land tenders to zoom out and to say, am I doing enough um, to make sure that Black and Indigenous people have access to this land? Um, and right now that answer is no, that like if we were doing enough, there would be more than 1% of US farmland that is owned by Black people. But but we're there, we're at less than a percentage point. And so we've got to at least get past that point. Like we've got to at least get to one and two and three and four percentage points. Um, but But we're like working backwards because again, in 1910, that number was out 14% of farmland was owned by black people. So we're trying to get back to where we were in 1910 and then build something that is even more imaginative and even more beautiful and even more equitable. Um, but we've got to all take up our, our aspects and our, our, our roles in this fight. And y'all are the frontline workers. And I just, I, I feel grateful to be in community with you. And I hope that every single person on this call is at least talking to the people they know and demystifying what reparations is and can be and the role of land grants and eminent domain reversals and all sorts of other versions of land back for black and indigenous people. So I'll pause here and bring Paige back up um, so we can have a deeper combo. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um... Before we move on, I just wanted to acknowledge, I think I may have misspoken Marcellus's last name earlier and just wanted to um, connect that to like, so Marcellus Williams, you know, in light of this news yesterday of his passing, I was thinking about your chapter in the book where you focus on the racial wealth gap, talking about how that is connected to historical and ongoing racial violence, um, including the disp disproportionate number of black people who are incarcerated yeah. and Throughout the book, you reference like so many statistics, different reports, old resources, more updated resources, and you compile them in this really beautiful way. But you also mentioned that as you're going through all these other references, they're all missing that white supremacy and land theft are at the root. And in these other discussions, people are missing that point. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a bit about that, like as you were going through all these resources, what made you decide to take this from you know, talking about just your family's story to seeing like, oh, hey, I think there's a gap in in the literature here. There's a gap in the conversation. And I, I want to compile these things and write about it in a way that addresses the true roots. Yeah, 1 million percent. I think that actually, um, hmm, I don't know. I can't pinpoint exactly when that became the framing for the book, but I know that it was early enough on. And I think there was a personal reason for that. And then there was this um, like more what was happening in the world at the time that I was working on this book proposal thing. So personally speaking within my family, so my grandfather is who I learned to love the land from, um, Alfred Baker. And he is who he spent his, his retirement purchasing land. He knew his family had, had lost a lot of acres over the last several decades. And he wanted to so, sort of like re- rebuild those acreage. Um, but his rebuilding project was also, um, was kind of grounded in a lot of like disdain and, um, and almost like disgust at his own father. And he really felt as though like, like he'd talk as though his father was like the weak link of the family. And as though his father had let white people and local government take his land. And that if his father was a more vigilant, smart, savvy person, he would have been able to protect the family against some of the land loss and violence that the family was exposed to. And I think what, what I just, it just never felt accurate to me. And I felt as though my grandfather was being a little hard on his dad and that he didn't really fully even understand, like, he was not removed enough to fully grasp how much his dad was up against. And so it was easier to blame his dad and say, oh, well, he was too busy drinking and he was too busy gambling. And, you know, while he was drinking, someone was taking his land and, you know, I'm going to be a different, better kind of savvier kind of person. And I do think that my grandfather was an incredibly 
smart and brilliant man and, and had done so much research to protect against that kind of land loss. But I also think that he ended up being lucky to be born in a different time and that his father came in an era where so many black people were losing their land. And, and actually that that land loss was spurring some of the addiction and mental health, you know, concerns and illnesses that, that people were struggling with because, you know, think of it like my great grandfather was a husband and father of 17 in a time where patriarchy said he was supposed to be a provider and a protector. And he was neither able to provide or protect for his family in the face of white supremacy in the Jim Crow South. And I think that in many ways may have drove him to drink more than he would have if business were going great. And if he was able to, um, you know, grow his farm um, unimpeded by those sort of systems. And so I think that it was very frustrating for him to know that no matter how hard he worked, um, it wasn't really ever going to be good enough and that he was still going to, to lose something and to have some, you know, always something breathing down his neck. I think that um, was the thing that he lived with that my grandfather didn't fully appreciate because my grandfather had migrated north during the Great Migration. So I think that that was something that I remember doing the research and wishing, I wish my grandfather were alive so I could help him rethink his perspective on his dad um, and and to to recognize that there are so many Black elders who are carrying a lot of shame that they just should not be carrying. This idea that they did something that they were um, not good enough to hold on to something that meant so much to their families when in actuality it was that they they had done everything that they could and that you know it wasn't that they weren't good enough it's that what the cards that were stacked up against them were stacked too tall um so i think that was the personal thing that i that i really wanted to leave people with um and that if no one else read the book i wanted black people to read the book and to sort of like heal and like uninternalize some of the things that they have been forced to survive um and i think there's like a survivor's guilt of of like okay I'm on the other side of this. And in some ways I think it's because I did something different in other ways. It's like, I, you know, it's, it's just like this dance and this tight rope. And um, I just wanted us to be able to shed some of that guilt. And then, so my grandfather died in 2019. I was doing this research just for my family. And then in 2021, a few years later is the time that I start actually working on the book as a book proposal. And that was a centennial anniversary of the Tulsa massacre. And so I think that was really framing my, my mindset as well when I was um, writing the proposal and digging into the book, because I just remember thinking that um, there were so many Black people who, again, had internalized this belief that we, you know, aren't, if we were as smart as other communities, we'd do better economically and we'd do differently economically. And me feeling as though, like, why are we carrying the blame when all of the moments when we did build our, up, our bootstraps in spite of white supremacy, um, our, our cities literally burned to the ground um, and were burned to the ground by white supremacists. And that, you know, large farm owners were ran out of the South and that, you know, there are so many stories in rural counties of, of black cattle ranchers having, you know, their, their herds poisoned and their wells poisoned and, and all of these things. It, 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 um, it sounds very conspiracy theory, like if you're not grounded in like the record. And I just remember thinking that if we did a better job of people understanding that things like the Tulsa massacre are not anomalies, they're not isolated incidences. There were entire years where, Black people were just like, if you survived and your town was not, you know, attacked by a mob or burned down, you were lucky, you know? And like, that was even before the Tulsa massacre. That was the red summer of 1919. And that was two years before. And there are so many um, Black people whose grand, Black people like me, my age, and, and some of y'all on this call, who our grandparents and our great grandparents have survived some really traumatic moments and, and all just trying to hold on to some land hold on to a house, hold on to a farm, hold on to a business, hold on to a dream that that someone before them had dared to dream. And I really wanted to tell that story so that again, so that that those of us who were thinking that we came from 
any sense of like inferiority could like really shed that. And so the, the rest of us could really be emboldened to walk boldly towards reparations. Because I think when you're, when you're facing this kind of stats, it's very easy to say, I would like to repair the harm done during like massacres, like the Tulsa massacre, like that, that feels easy. Like I want, like there are living survivors who are, who are above the age of a hundred, who are still going in and out of courtrooms, trying to get restitution for things that they were children during. Like they, they're not the descendants of, they were survivors of these attacks themselves. And the US court system is forcing them to still prove why they should get some sort of restitution as if, they're not still living with with the harm and and the you know not just the pain but like the irreparable economic damage the the loss of of connection to a place that was once a home and so i think that um the more that we tell these stories not as a form of like trauma porn but as a form of a form of saying if us history feels like trump like trauma porn and too traumatic to teach the children then we should actually stop doing that and we should do something different and that should not be radical to say. Like that should be a very like run of the mill thing to say, you know, we can disagree on other policies, yeah. but wanting to fix the harm of the past yeah. um, should be something that we are excited to embrace. You don't even know where our children are. Um, I'm seeing a lot of love for you in the chat and appreciation for all the intersectionalities you're bringing into this conversation. Um, I wanted to give some space to some of our other organizers, um, if anyone had some questions. Maria, from the organizing team, or if you wanted to share um, some ways this book has inspired your work, Rita, hop off mute. Yo. Hey, what's good, Brian? Hey. Uh, I'm Zachariah. I'm uh, one of the members of the field organizing team focused in the Southeast in particular. So I feel like any uh, any kind of expose onto the history of Black land and Black land loss is going to be centered in this region in particular. And it's like stuff you were talking about, heirs property and the specific kind of um, threats and obstacles, you know, a lot of that lives here in the history of the South and is a part of the work that we're doing in this region. So I'm currently farming as well in Virginia um, on land that I don't own, mm. uh, but have relative security uh, with relationship to. Um, and I feel like there's a lot of questions I have, but maybe one um, that was insinuated by what you were sharing. Um, you know, it's 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 a lot more concrete and traceable to some extent, like how through various different um, strategies and tactics uh, and institutions, Black land was lost. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this other, you know, it's only been this hundred year process from 14% to less than one. Mm -hmm. And parallel to that, uh, there's also this thing that you were saying of trying to show people that, you know, in our own imagination of liberation, why land is so instrumental and foundational to any kind of political imagination. And, you know, that doesn't seem necessarily like the loss of that that knowledge um, that was passed down to you to some extent by your family directly, that loss of that knowledge seems to be a related but distinct kind of circumstance that I'm finding where I'm like, you know, even in the rise of BLM and the consciousness around that, there's still this absence of conversation around, not completely, but you know, uh, it's noticeable. Let's mm. just say that. Mm. So I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm sure there's so many answers and some of them are just not so concrete, but what your thoughts are about, you know, not just the loss of land, but the loss of our imagination of struggle and life and liberation with land, you know? 
Yeah, 1 million percent. And I love the way that you just phrased that. So just thank you for that so much. Um, yeah, I think that part of this is a, um, a byproduct of the Great Migration. I think even though most Black people still live in the South, like that is a fact, more than 50% of Black Americans live in the South. That's not accounting for the Midwest or like Northern rural areas the way there are in like upstate New York and whatnot. So most Black people do live outside of these larger cities. But um, just after the Great Migration, I think that a lot of the focus became on the Black urban experience, which is why like urban is like used as like code for Black. <laughs> When it's like, well, number one, not a black person lives in the city, and there are city experiences that are not black experience, you know. So, um, I just felt like there was such a flattening that happened, and like I will say that I am definitely someone who internalized that as someone who grew up in New York, and you just believe that, you know, cities like New York, Oakland, Chicago, um, Detroit are are the black experiences, and like you, you, you really, it's just like such an erasure. Um, so I think that there's definitely a need to like reset that culturally first. Um, and I don't think it would be too hard to reset because so many of the black justice movements were started in the South. I think BLM is actually an anomaly in not being started in the South, but the civil rights movement was a Southern movement. Even when it was in cities, it was in Southern cities, um, Atlanta, Birmingham, Montgomery, right? Like, um, even before that, um, like, I, I just think that if we return to those roots, um, we will we will see a lot of change. I also think that it requires again this like reframe around the way people of all races see the South. And Amani Perry wrote a book, South to America, that I really love that kind of addresses this. And she talks about how Americans of every single race they project all of their national shame onto the South. So if you're a white person and you're like trying to feel better than other white people. You're like, you know, it's just the South. Like we should just let, you know, Florida secede. And, and it feels easier to say that and to like blame all of the racism on the South than to account for the fact that the racism is all over, right? Like it's it's everywhere. Um, and I think the same for others. Like I think even for black people, I think it's easier to say like, I would never live in the South um, for those who don't anymore live in the South, then to acknowledge that there are concessions and trade-offs that we're making to live in the North, to make in the, to live in the West as well. Um, so I think to get back that imagination, we have to stop pretending like the South is the worst of America and that the rest of America is like squeaky clean. I think we just have to tell the truth that every single inch of America is, um, and these are not my words, uh, I think so many people before have have said that all of America is desecrated land. Like if we acknowledge that it's all stolen land, I think going a step further to say it's all desecrated land means that we have to do work to like restore the the sacredness and the sanctity and the and the beauty to to the space, to the land that we inhabit. And that takes work um, and that takes imagination. But I think we're missing political imagination in general. So I think it's just needed across the board. I think it's easier for people to say, let's not rock the boat too much. Let's ask for like the bare minimum. And then asking for the bare minimum becomes the more radical standpoint. So that asking for something more becomes like, oh, you're not grounded in reality as opposed to like, I just want more than like incremental change. And so I think we've just got to like, have the conversations with our people um, because I think people are just like, they don't wanna be the first to step out and say, we deserve better. Um, but again, I think that oftentimes my like entry point into this conversation is travels. I think people will often travel and there's no country on this earth that is like, you know, perfect, but like we'll travel to other countries and realize that there are different ways that people are living on this land. People have way better work-life balance. People are eating fresher fruit they are vacationing on prettier beaches. They are, you know, like they, they're like, everything's better. The healthcare systems, all those things are better. And like, how are we in the US with all of the acreage that we have, all the wealth that we have, how do we not have that? And I think the more that we can like ask that question and demand more and say like, it, it should be the bare minimum to expect like good, fresh in season fruit in our stores and like farmer's markets being accessible and time to be on land and like, you know, people gardening in their own backyard. And like the more that people start to do that, then they start to stop settling as much. 
Um, so I just think it's it's a lot of different things that need to happen. Um, I don't think that because it's a lot of things means that we need to like avoid the conversation though. I think we should lean in. And I think that farmers are actually like so uniquely positioned um, to, to have these sorts of conversations. I actually saw something recently that was like astronauts and farmers are some of the like um, biggest activists because when you have like planted a seed for another day and like had to grow it over time, like you become so invested in tomorrow. And when you have seen earth zoomed out and like from above itself, there's this like term for it called earth light. And this idea that like sometimes just like natural beauty is so awe inspiring that it like kind of forces you to be progressive almost. And it's like, no one has to indoctrinate you. It's just like seeing the world in this natural beauty is just like, why are why are we doing anything but this? Like, why why are we wasting our time on anything but preserving this and like having more time to just marvel and and like benefit from this? And I think that the more we can just like put it that way, then it's like, it doesn't sound that radical to be like, I think we should all have more time to like eat better food and breathe cleaner air and drink fresher water. Like that doesn't sound radical. But like the path to that is absolutely land back and reparations and small farming and like regenerative farming and, you know, a rethinking of agribusiness in this country and like, you know, money out of politics because lobbying is the reason we have the problem. You know, of course, there's like the the the, the actual policies that get us there. But I think if people just can remember what their values really are and that like we've been conditioned to care about other things or think we care about other things, but at the core what it's really all about is is this. It doesn't take much imagination to say, why are people telling me I can't get there in my lifetime? Like, why why does it take more than why why can't we invest the next couple decades in that and grow old in a country that has renewable energy and and like we're getting you know, subscription boxes of fresh food from local farmers is like a norm. And, you know, like, I think that we can help people see that there's so much more that's possible, but I do think it takes, um, yeah, all those earlier steps. Yeah, it's super, super helpful and comprehensive. I mean, I have plenty of questions, but I'll let some of the other organizers and participants join in. No, I appreciate that so much. I mean, if no one else has questions, I'm down to hear yours. But if anyone else does want to. I see a hand raised. Hi, everybody. Hey. Uh, my name is Camila Yasmin. I'm a... Uh... Of myself and <laughs> some um, founding of some things um, in central Virginia, uh, um, stewarding uh, maybe like 69 acres um, of yeah. woodland, paddocks and gardens and houses and roadways and all that stuff. Um, and so I'm so pleased that you're here to talk about this here with this lens um, for a number of reasons, and it's just like even trying to find the wording, you know, um, on websites, the message um, to speak about, uh, I think the term like American descendants, mm -hmm. um, people in this lineage, um, and our relationship, uh, maybe not necessarily being able, I don't know if we get to say rematriation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I don't know if we get to say, you know, we're not in repatriating. I think we're beyond that. Um, and so what what's our language um, around our relationship in this way? So I'm I'm, I'm very happy <laughs> to have you um, maybe maybe not expound, but just even to tell you that um, like if I'm if I'm needing to do more to communicate um, to my community who, you know, are like, hey, you know, slavery, is, you know, or, you know, needing amenities. Mm -hmm you know, um, or needing soft life or even having come from a, like maybe land-based or even rural environments and are like not going back. Um, so, you know, needing, uh, I think very flexible bridges um, to even being able to consider what was lost. Mm -hmm. um, what is the language around that 
for this particular group of people mean while, while we try to figure out our language around everything. Mm. Yeah, I love that question. And I love that you use rematriation. Um, I will also say that like kind of what you just ended on, we're we're looking for language for so many things. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think that it's okay to borrow and to remix different things. Like um, I, I lean into the language of like land stewardship and we're trying to get back to stewardship. But I also say that land is a birthright for black Americans. And I am unapologetic about saying that there is, there is a right that black people have in this country um, as people whose ancestors were forced to work this land to be able to take part in, in like having this land and not being forced to work it. Like, like, I think it's a very ironic thing that when the country is profiting off of black people being on land, that's where black people are. And the moment that black people are able to profit from us being on land, we're being corralled into cities. And, and we think that being out in nature and being in rural areas is white people's stuff, you know? And like, we, we say these and we internally these things ourselves. And I think that the language for that is anti-agricultural backlash and someone else coined that. I think there's, I mean, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of different ways to refer to this, but the person who coined anti-agricultural backlash, I'm forgetting his name right now, but he was talking about the fact that again, like great post great migration, a lot of black people really, it was like, I don't want to be, um, it's kind of similar language, this, like this derogatory language about being fresh off the boat. And so it was this idea of if you were too, if it was too odd that you were fresh out of the South, um, then you were not as easily acclimating to life in these Northern and Western cities. And so literally in cities like Chicago and, and Harlem and Oakland, it was like you wanted to assimilate as quickly as possible. And they'd be like, all right, you know, trade in those overalls for your for your three piece suit and and don't let people notice that you are a southerner. And I think that that resulted in people just not wanting anything to do with agriculture. I think one of the most prominent examples of this in like a non serious way is there's this meme that kind of like comes back around like every couple months. And it's like, would you pick cotton for and it's always like insert dollar amount that's like a large amount so would you pick cotton for like 350 dollars an hour and the amount of people in the comments like there's no amount of money i'd ever pick cotton for and i'm like 350 dollars an hour that's not slavery y'all like we have to be able to separate and i think that's where like reclaiming our relationship to land is a part of this is that not any sort of labor on land is slavery Labor on land is labor on land. And we've been doing that long before colonization. We've been doing that on the African continent and, and, and anywhere else across the diaspora that we've gone. But um, but what like it's the the experience, it's the the violence that happened to force that labor, that is the thing. And I think getting people to see that will take some time. So for example, though, like when I first started writing this book, I was a new returned Southerner, um, part of this like great remigration as people are calling it, I call it the great return. And I was living in Atlanta. And I don't think that I ever saw myself as living outside of the city. I was like, I wanna be in the South, but I'll be in a city. And my, my path was, I started caring about land through my grandparents and through the archival work and through the historian work and through writing about land. And then that trickled into, well, I mean, I could grow some herbs in my windowsill into, okay, well, we should get a house in the suburbs where we can have a garden into now we have eight chickens and like four raised garden beds and fruit trees and bushes and all these things. And like, it continues to grow there from there. But like, there was a time not long ago where you could not get me to do any of this. And so I don't think for many black people that it, this is too far off. I think for a lot of us, there's this like Stockholm syndrome to like being in the North and West where you are being convinced that it's so much better than the South, so much better than rural living. Um, and, and that is what feels like the soft life for you. It feels like, why would I go back and revert to harder living, harsher living? Um, but I think it's number one important to realize that like, I talk a lot about like our ancestors' wildest dreams and they didn't dream of like never working ever. They dreamed of working on their own time, of working at their own pace, of like controlling the means of negotiating the pay for that work. Like 
It was the ability to grow vegetables because you wanted to, not because they're telling you to. Like, I don't want to just grow cotton and tobacco. And I want to grow like okra and collard greens and this, and I want to hunt and I want to do this. And like, so choice is the important part. Being in the South, being in a rural area, being on a farm is not the issue. It's the lack of choice in those environments that, that or in any environment that becomes the issue. And the more that we can remind people of that, I think we can remember, thank you to, um, uh, Carolina, sorry for putting uh, Azibo's name in the chat. Yes, this is who who coined anti-agricultural backlash. Um, so thank you so much for that and for the link. Um, but yeah, I think like reversing that anti-agricultural backlash entails just learning to remember that like our ancestors loved the land, not because they were forced to love the land. Like they love the land, period. Um, and so when we say rematriation, we are returning to the ways of our, our ancestors and those before us. And that includes pre-colonization. And um, I could talk about this all day, but the last thing I'm gonna say is I also think it's important to bring expertise, like the, the, the word and like the understanding of expertise into this conversation. Cause even like the shame that we have around being laborers and being um, in the South and being like on a farm and in a rural area, I think comes from like a downplaying of how much knowledge and information and expertise it takes to be an agricultural worker. Um, and, and I think that that stems from the fact that we still have internalized that, like, even if you don't truly believe that, like, our country's education system has kind of, like, encouraged people to believe that Black enslaved people were dumb and, like, not as, as savvy. And, like, even those are like, I don't believe that. But, like, you do because you don't believe that Black people were skilled and you don't I think that like, again, it, it's not our fault. It's the way that it's framed in school. But I think an interesting thing for me to find in my research was number one, like a lot of the earliest like colonizers and enslavers were often commenting on, on why they were targeting specific black peoples and specific African tribes because of how skilled they were. Like, oh, hey, we just met some people who are really great at rice production. And what if we enslaved them and brought them to the Carolinas and made them do it there? Like, it was not like, oh, let's bring these dumb, oh, let's like trick these dumb people. It's like, if we can use our tools to our advantage, then we can bring these really smart people who have learned our languages extremely fast, who have served as translators and, and, and trade and all sorts of things. Like if we can take advantage of those skills and like use it to our advantage, then we can profit from it. And that's always what it's been. And I think being able to see like, oh, I don't, yeah, like, like I think there was a part of me that always thought oh, I, I wanna come from people who are, you know, who are great. And that meant not sharecroppers, that meant not farmers. Like I wanted to come from, you know, kings and queens and, and you know, academics and whatever the case may be. And realizing that like the farmers and sharecroppers and landowners that I come from were, herbalists and were like botanists and were were just were experts at what they did and that expertise was mislabeled and like taken advantage of and by the time that they were trying to profit from it the economy was transforming like right before them but like seeing it as that helps us to like be okay with words like rematriation birthright um acknowledging that we come from people who knew this land really, really, really well, and that was used against them. Um, but we can return to that. Like, what does it mean to also know the land really, really well and take pride in what in what that looks like? To take pride in knowing different plants from one another, on knowing how to problem solve in the field, knowing like, hey, I'm I'm dealing with this, and I don't need to turn to chemicals or or you know expensive machines the way that industry in this country is telling me to. I can I can return to like ancestral ways of being and that's that's such a gift that we have no thank you i really appreciate you asking that thanks y'all if anyone else has questions feel free to hop in we've got until about 4 30 with bria so and i love the comments like yeah yeah a lot of the agricultural wisdom that all of us carry in us is so downplayed. And I think it's really important to not let that happen, especially in a world where climate experts and scientists are, are investing in things that just feel like overcomplicated when there are things, when there's like easier 
interventions that we are stepping over and just don't be afraid to acknowledge that like you carry expertise in you. Oh, I see another hand raised. Is it Carolina, Carolina? Hi, yes, it's Carolina or Carolina. I actually, I work with National Young Farmers Coalition. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I, and I'm sorry, I can't come on video because I have that small, that sweet, sweet, small town Wi-Fi. Um, so I would, I, I heard you talk about the fact that, um, and I don't want to misquote you, but, but that this is political. Mm. Yeah. That this work is political in its very nature. And, um, I know that there is just a lot of disdain that exists in especially in the quote-unquote sustainable farming movement about being political I would just love to hear you talk about maybe um, making some of those uh, you know sometimes invisible spider web threads uh, visible and and what kind of having that conversation about participating in the political system what that means to you and how you are sort of navigating all of that Mm -hmm. Wait, so just to go back, when you said that, like, some people are more reticent to, to, like, be political in the space, where have you found that to be? Or, like, in what ways have you found that to be? Yeah, it's a great question. So to, to specify, I see uh, hesitance in participating in, like, policy setting, and especially at the federal policy level, like, it's something that is uh, for them, but I don't want anything to do with it because it's yucky, which is, you know, gosh, there's so much to say there, but, mm -hmm. um, but what, what, uh, what does it look like to reinvigorate sort of our kinds of movements that we, that we work through into the decision-making process at the national level? Got you. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, it comes from a real place. I think for a lot of people, um, especially like our elders in and, and like seasoned farmers, like they have been trying to integrate themselves into those spaces and to ch to make those changes and have really just found so much red tape and pushback. I think that's something that I especially see as far as like with the USDA. I think there are so many people who are just like, even if the USDA were to announce some like really great thing tomorrow, I wouldn't trust it because of how longstanding the like harm is. Um, and so I think that that is real. Um, and also that like, there are a lot of agencies that kind of pay lip service to this. And so being like careful with your energy and with getting your hopes up comes from a real place. Um, but the idea of like not being political in general, like, I think it's okay to say, this might not have new for me. I don't want to work within this agency or this local office, but there is politics is going to happen with or without your engagement. And we can't just let it keep happening to us. Like, especially because ag policy is so like not sexy and it gets swept under the rug. You know, there are not people like standing on the steps of the Capitol, like protesting and making demands around agricultural policy, but it has such far reaching um, impacts on how all of you on this call, like do what you do, the the zoning, the access, the, the resources, like everything is really shaped by things that happen um, you know, federally and then, on, you know, on a state based level. So we have to be engaged in some way. Um, and I just, I, that's why I asked the question, because I'm just like, people who are completely apolitical, I guess one thing to be like, okay, I'm not going to work within USDA, but I am going to work with unions, or I am going to work with co-ops and to try in these strategic ways, but you just got to find your lane in some way. Um, because I, yeah, I think that it's just, the stakes are too high and they've always been too high and they're going to be too high for quite some time um, for us to be cavalier nonchalant about it. Um, I also think that for those of us who, in addition to being young farmers, like you're already a unicorn in this space because they, they don't want us in it. Like, you know, for us, they're like, okay, do this as a hobby, not not as someone who's trying to like make a living and who's trying to, you know, community or or whatever the beautiful missions that I'm sure many of you have. But if you are a young woman, a young black person, a young indigenous person, a young like, like if you have any queer, like if you have a compounded identity, it's going to make it even harder for you to take up space. Um, and we are just so 
boxed out of opportunities to be taken seriously. And so we have to take ourselves even that much more seriously. Um, and we can't cede political power by by thinking like, oh, you know, I'm just I'm just here to like plant some seeds and like it's never just planting seeds. And I think there should be a world where this is not political. Like I think it actually says a lot that something as as like life sustaining and and just like normal as growing food is such a political thing, but it is. And so living in this country, farming in this country means that we take that into account. And if you're someone who has been lucky enough to not experience those things firsthand and to be like, oh, this sounds a little dramatic, like congratulations, like this is me letting you know that you've got some privilege and like, you know, do, do that extra work and, and go the extra mile for those who cannot afford to not be political in this work. Who, who would not be in, you know, in rooms like this and would not have a farm to work if it weren't for political organizers before us um, and even community organizers who keep us afloat, right? So I think that we just have to honor those sources, honor that a lot of us are standing on, you know, the, the shoulders and backs of, of union organizers who made it possible um, for small farmers to still be around. Um, black sharecroppers, um, indigenous, you know, landowners, and like so many others who are still fighting for access to land today. And that is political as hell. And then maybe there will be a world where we can laugh back and this like, remember when like owning land was a thing that, you know, was considered, you know, political, <laughs> like, no, you know, but, but that is where we are. And so we've got to be able to own that. And I think, if you're someone who gets it and are trying to talk to people who don't get it, um, just reminding them that they would not be able to do the things that they do, whether like regardless of race, like all of us, if you are not Tyson, <laughs> you exist because of organizers before you and, um, and your work is only possible because someone is still fighting to make sure that there are not entire monopolies on how we grow and consume our food. Oh, I so appreciate the very nuanced, contextualized, and realistic response. Thank you so much, Bri. Thank you. No, I appreciate you, Boo. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I love these questions. Like, these are so deep. I see another one in the um, comment section. Someone said, my question is about practices you've become aware of for resolving the grief of Black land loss. As I reflect on what you shared about your grandfather's drinking, I'm curious how both Black elders and younger generations are working through the pain of those losses in ways that compromise our wellness and relationships. Yes, Kendra, to this question. It's so, so real. Um, it's actually, I, I think it's why... I'm careful in how I talk about reparations and I talk about it as like a series of policies because I think if, um, in an ideal world, of course, yes, reparations includes money. But if tomorrow every black person in America received like a direct deposit, that would not do away with all of the harms of slavery. And I think it is, I think we should be wary to let people think that it would, because then they can just slap a, a low dollar amount. I mean, yes, and I still need that direct deposit too. Okra felt that, <laughs> felt that deeply. And my issue though is like, I think that if if the idea becomes that one payment is enough, then number one, they can set a dollar amount to it, send it out, and be like, why are you still complaining? We we handled that. I've wiped my hands clean of that. I am not responsible. I have absolved myself of the need to uh, to account for anti-Blackness in America. And so my issue is number one, if Black people are not the deciders of what that dollar amount is, they could send out a, a measly 5,000. What is like, like, do you know how easily a $5,000 check could be eaten up by just like a month or two of bills for the average person in America? You know, like that's not going to to stop the the you know like the, the compounded harms of slavery. So like I think that's where I just get weary of like if people think that a one time direct deposit payment enough is enough, then we are really misunderstanding it because if we got the payment tomorrow in a country that is still banning our ability to talk about this history in schools and libraries, that can't be reparations. And there are so many people to the point of this question though. Um, I, I really think that like mental health. Um, should need to be one aspect and one like 
component of this policy too. So I think there would need to be like direct restitution. I think there needs to be eminent domain reversals. I think there needs to be um, institutional, you know, like injections into things like HBCUs and black owned businesses and all sorts of things. And I also think that mental health would need to be part of it. I, I not even, I, think, I know that there are black elders who literally were put in asylums because of the things that white supremacy did to them. And I, this idea of individual responsibility is, is making us crazy, like legitimately. And I don't use that word lightly because I know that it's so stigmatized, but I, but I do think that there is a very maddening aspect of white supremacy. Because when you really think of what it means, and I actually, I, when I was on a book tour, like I was in Detroit and there was a black woman who was talking about it. And she was like, yeah, my uncle, you know, owned three properties in this one area in Detroit. And in the sixties, they came through use eminent domain to clear all of the black families out of it he lost it like you don't get the dollar amount of the property that you owned when you when you lose that money and so to think of like i just like days after i talked to her i just couldn't stop thinking about that like what it means to spend your whole life saving and scrapping and working and saving some more and buying property and using that to buy more property and like building out your dream and then the government knocking on your door one day and being like I'm gonna take this and you have no, like, and if you fight back, you could end up behind bars. And so you just let it happen. That would make me crazy, right? Like that, like, I think like we have to be able to say that. Um, and there's there's a lot of um, important work that's being done to name that like, like we put too much onus on people to deal with the trauma that a that a system has put on them. And I think we need to say, you know, that that there are a lot of people living today who are dealing with stuff that they did not cause themselves. There are people who are raised by those people, right? Like, so I was, so this is my great grandfather who was the who was the heavy drinker, and so I was not raised by him, but like it shaped how my grandfather saw him and saw the world to watch his grand to watch his dad drinking and coping with land loss in that way. And like that shaped the way that he raised his children and the way that he brought us up as grandchildren. And like, so I, I think it's just important to name that. But like, yes, we need a financial investment in a major one, not this little $2 billion here. Like the most conservative estimates are like in the hundreds of billions of dollars is the, is the like estimation of land loss. So we need a really significant financial investment. And we need to acknowledge that we have to tell the truth and we have to give people space to heal from the trauma of having their dreams taken and snatched from under them. And that that will not go away um, with like a one-off check. But I feel you, Oprah, I do feel you. Yeah, Bria, um, thinking about, you know, something you and I were chatting about earlier and you talking about how these, just a check isn't gonna be the solution, you know, um, even if that check in some cases might allow black and brown folks to own land again, if that's in a rural area or returning to rural areas, um, the challenges that come with that too, and often the safety issues that come with that, sometimes even due to just like one neighbor, you know, um, Unfortunately, like in my organizing, we're talking to some black farmers in Michigan. That's an issue. And um, sure, it's even more challenging in the South in some places. Um, so just thinking about like the other things that we need to be doing, you know, while we're working for these incremental policy changes that are slow and sometimes are hard to keep our hopes up and momentum going for that, you know, and then a lot of folks in this room are also doing like grassroots work day to day, trying to build some more resilience for their communities. And then also trying to dream up this future where folks can be out on rural land together and feel safe and feel in community with all their neighbors. Um, thinking about the part in, there's so many parts in your book where you talk about these like incredible examples of organizing um, black folks buying like a thousand acres together and families, like hundreds of families living there and building like churches and grocery stores on this land and like actually building a huge community. Um, and yeah, we end up in so many conversations now of like everyone's searching for community, looking for community, trying to build it. 
and it all feels like this very vague, unattainable concept. So I was just wondering if you could speak to that and, you know, maybe share like, some advice for people that are trying to actually do these things. What do you think that that like that actual resilient community looks like and how do we need to get there? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think that just we have to insist on collectivist um, models of everything that we do, like not just ownership, but yeah, just every, everything that we do should be done together. Um, and And when we were doing things in that way, um, we we really saw like what was possible, even when the federal government was doing nothing. Like I'm not a pick yourself up by your bootstraps kind of person at all. I am I'm someone who even like Vero put something in the chat. Oh no, not Vero. Um, someone above Vero, Farah said something about like, yeah, like these narratives and and around and these like anti-black narratives that that keep us from leaning in. And to me, this 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 fear of being labeled as lazy or have not having earned the things that I'm like asking for or demanding is just something that I think we just need to shed. Like every black person on this call, like release yourself from the need to prove other people you work hard. I just, I think that it is like mind blowing in, um, in like considering all of the work that our ancestors have done to still be trying to prove that. And I think that um, I, there used to be a time when I would really try to assert, you know, like the black excellence narrative. And I just found that it keeps us talking in circles. Like who cares if I'm not excellent? I actually have no, like I should deserve to be mediocre. There are a lot of mediocre white landowners who are able to provide their families with dignity and safety and joy. And I should not need to be excellent to have the same things that we should all have. And I think getting back to the idea of there being just like a, a human right, a, a just like a basic like quality of life that we should all be demanding, I think is the way that we get out of that cycle of having like collectivism, like thrown back in our faces and weaponized against us and and like threatened um, because I, I just think that that's what other countries have been able to like do with the wealth that they've hoarded. You know, it's not wealth that they've earned, but at least they've turned it into a, a a baseline quality of life that is like pretty solid. And I think that we have just agreed to this like cost of living, this like need to work minimum 40 hours a week or else you haven't earned it. You know, like even like politicians, like they think they're progressive when they say things like, no one working a full-time job should be in poverty. And it's like, why have we settled there? Like, why should anyone live in conditions that we have outworked the need? Like we have the enough technological advancements and we've enough surplus that we don't need people to work at that pace. We don't need to be excellent. So I think our insistence that we are excellent enough, that we are deserving enough is actually keeping us in the like cycle of, 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 of like having to keep convincing someone else. And then they tell us that we aren't and that we're being just lazy and that we're asking for too much. And then we insist on proving that we're not asking for too much. And we're actually only asking for crumbs. And I'm like, I want us to be encouraged to ask for a lot more. Like, I just, I think that we we have settled and the bar is so low. And that's actually something I talk about is like, when people are like, oh, well, if we have enough money for reparations and we have enough money for this, and I'm like, that's not the gotcha you think it is. We do. Like, we do have enough money for reparations and guaranteed income and like small farming to be the norm and not, you know, and that to be subsidized and for like universal health care and for student loan debt. And I, I know I'm getting carried away and getting political here, but like, I do think it's important to think of like, like, don't be afraid of it snowballing. Like, actually, that's a beautiful thing. Like, if we provide reparations to Black people through eminent domain reversals and cash payments and all sorts of investments, like, think of all of the beautiful things that we will do with that land and the ways that it will, like, reverberate for other people. And the same thing with these other policies. So I think that just, like, but collectivism is, is the thing that gets there. And if if we got reparations tomorrow and didn't know and weren't incentivized to to like lean on each other um I think that we could see you know some just becoming who we were becoming the beast that we were trying to like repair um and I just I'm, I'm not someone who um believes that black capitalism is going to be the solution to save us I think that black people should be encouraged to 
run businesses. I'm not saying that, but I think that this idea that profit comes before anything else is something I just deeply, deeply reject. And I think that again, it's, it's what's been in my family. Like the first landowner in my family bought land with his, with his family. He passed that land on to his sons. Um, my great, great uncle was like, Hey, we shouldn't hoard this opportunity. I mean, we're, we're like a black landowning family in the midst of the Jim Crow South. And he deeded some of that land for the creation of one of the first black schools in the county. Like I come from a family that never hoarded land. And so even though I always knew like, okay, I come from a family that has land and we're not rich. And I don't understand that. Like, why are we still working class? But I think, um, I think that there's like a beauty in like, the goal was not getting rich. The goal was feeding each other and housing each other and having a safety net. And that's what my grandfather provided us. And he didn't need us to be billionaires. His goal was not to make the next Bill Gates or whatever, because Bill Gates is hoarding land too, as we speak, even as he's funding all this climate work. So I think that remembering that like, um, for us black and indigenous folks and other communities of color, like the goal of our ancestors was to, to just live a really good life. And we don't need to turn into, you know, those who enacted violence against us as we build out our ventures. Like they can be really beautiful um, ways that we connect with the community without us having to do that. So yeah, I'm, I'm really big on collectivism, whether that be in a co-op, whether that be just within your family, like it doesn't need to use a fancy name. Like if you buy land with friends, that's collectivist. If you, you know, my wife and I have land and um, it's not much, we have an acre and we have eight chickens on that land. And those eight chickens lay way more eggs than we ever need. And so anyone who's walking by, we're like, hey, Miss Stephanie, take some eggs with you. Oh, the orchid man, take some eggs with you. Like everybody gets some eggs. And like, Sometimes the chickens, you know, they end up in somebody's front lawn and, you know, it's like, it's a beautiful thing for our neighborhood. And I think the more that we can, can do that and have our land be something that other people can benefit from and learn from, the better. Yeah, thank you, Bria. Um, I think, unfortunately, like more often than not, excellence is equated with the level of participation in capitalism that you have, even if it is related to farming and um in your book you talk about like transforming what it means to be stewards of land and I think part of that too is finding like how do you want to define your success outside of capitalism even though unfortunately like the USDA and a lot of farming organizations and a lot of farming communities only see you as legitimate or like a successful farmer if you're participating in capitalism or or succeeding um in that way Mm -hmm. I think we got time for like a couple more questions too. And I don't want to take up too much more mic space. So if anyone else wants to, to ask Bria a question, feel free to hop in before we wrap up. I love what Jojo said, rich in land. That's the best version of rich. So, so true. Looks like Anna has a question. Go ahead, Anna. Hi there, Bria. This is uh, Anna. I'm also a staff member with Young Farmers. Um, and I'm a young farmer myself who has been on uh, really on a journey of uh, collectivism and cooperative, both living, farming, um, so it's, it's something I've been studying the last three years in grad school, how to form cooperatives, build land trusts, and yeah, just create different formats for, for collectivism. And my question's more, I guess, personal and specific to the lands that I on or the potential of lands, um, and something that's, that's been underway for, for some years now. Um, yeah. there, there's a possibility that I will be, be purchasing like within the next few months with my family, but also, um, and not on paper with, with friends, um, in our farming community. Um, it's a farm property with several, uh, buildings on it and farm infrastructure. Um, and this is, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, New Mexico, we have 
um, yeah, some of them, some of the most indigenous folks, um, per capita living here who are still on their original lands. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, you know, this is not in the, the black experience, but in the, um, ways of reparations for uh, indigenous people to the land. Um, I'm curious to hear from you, like what are some approaches to like living in principle of collectivism in like a practical way and also really uh, like with the opportunity of collective ownership, how to invite um, and yeah, facilitate land back while also you know, needing to collectively benefit from the land and make it sustainable economically. Yeah, one million percent. Um, first of all, thank you for all the work that you're doing. Um, I, I think that's so, so important. And I think that being able to show people like different models of ownership is really important because a lot, but I think the system is really been like wants us to believe that there's only one way to own land and that's to do so in a very selfish um, way that's like mine, mine, mine. Um, and there's there's so many different ways. I, I love that um, Leah Peniman and Soul Fire Farm are the first ones to put meat onto it. But I know that so many other people um, have like cultural easement agreements. I think those are really cool. And I think that that's something that my family is digging into and that people like just in general, we should all look into, which is like the idea that even if you are the one who holds the deed, that you're allowing access to your land to like the, the folks who have ancestral ties to the land that they might want to visit or fish on that land or hunt on that land and that you're open to them doing so. Um, again, like I think there's informal ways that this collectivism can happen. And I also acknowledge that for black people, especially having that deed matters and having that deed be a clear deed matters. Um, and I, I think that like in an ideal world, there would be a world where we don't need the deeds, where they're not like rigid borders around things. But right now, like black landowners are having their land encroached upon, are facing all sorts of like legal restrictions on what they can and can't do with the land that that they have. And so I recognize that like ownership is it does matter in the current world that we live in. Um, and and that like, yeah, the just the state is not invested in seeing black people successfully own land so we have to to be on our p's and q's um and and heirs property is a really you know is is the best example of how collectivist land ownership gets threatened um i am an heirs property owner so i've seen that within my family my grandfather is one of 17 children so if that's my grandfather you can imagine how many hundreds of grandchildren and great grandchildren are still alive and have access to and are heirs, property owners of that land, and kind of seeing the ways that we are preyed upon by developers who are trying to push us off of that is it's really disgusting. And so I think that the more that we are um, really like vigilant of like these tactics and that we understand the legal system, the better. Um, but I think that like with the deed, like when you have ownership, you can call the shots, and I think that matters a lot. Because again, my um my grandfather is the is the one in my family who comes from a long line of land ownership. Um, but my grandmother was born a sharecropper, and she knew the experience intimately. You could work land that you love deeply, that you know intimately, that you are really invested in. Um, and if the owner of that land decides to do something different with it, it's it's going to be up to them at the end of the day. And if you are not the one who has the deed, then you're not the one who gets to call the shots. And um, I think that while that's still the case, we need Black and Indigenous people to have deeds, to own land. And I think that's why it's so important to see like conservationist groups that are seeding land. I know it happens so much in the Pacific Northwest and in California, especially, um, where, you know, like just like hundreds of acres of the redwoods will be given back. Um, Oh, I love that what you said, Camila. I, I love that being able to access land on a Black Indigenous rural route through a land trust. I actually knew, uh, I know a land trust in North Carolina that's been doing that too. And I met them through one of the Black women that they um, deeded the land to. And yeah, I think it's really cool that land trusts are starting to do that. And I think it's it's showing that we, um, even while we wait for a federal government to make the investment in reparations, there are other ways that other industries can do it. And so like conservationist groups, you know, any sort of land trust, private landowners, like like there's an organization called Resource Generation, um, which is like representing like millennials who are set to inherit 
a lot of wealth and land from their parents and grandparents. And it's teaching them how to like, kind of give some of that land away, give some of that wealth away and do different things with it. And I think it's really cool to see that kind of work popping up because this idea that it's like, oh, sorry, like my hands are tied. is like, no, there's actually a lot we can be doing. And some of us have more, more access to do that than others. But I think it's really important to do. Um, I know we're at the end of the call. Thank y'all so much. I just want to quickly, quickly like run through some of the other questions that I saw. Thought upcoming presidential election, I think our options are really, really trash. But in the context of land ownership and land reclamation, I do think thinking of who gets to appoint the next um, secretary of agriculture really does matter. Bill Sack has been like just so, so detrimental to black farmers and, and black land ownership in general. Um, and I think it's it's really time to get him out and to get someone to commit to assigning someone different to that post. And I know there's a lot of different groups who have ideas on who that can be. Um, I think that I, I, I don't wanna get anyone in trouble. I don't think I could say partisan things here, but I do have an election column on Friday 29 Unbothered where I do talk openly about this and about the fact that even though I, I don't love all of the options that we have, I'm someone who believes in like playing a long game and what are the conditions we gotta organize within. Um, I, have, I have under, Previous trash administrations been able to get ballot initiatives passed, been able to get funding disseminated, been able to get certain appointments made. And I think we got to think strategically about that, too. Like, what is the current state of agriculture and how can we push the, whoever the next president is going to be? Because someone will be that person. How can we push that person to not forget agriculture and remember that? We are we are feeding this country. Y'all are feeding this country. Excuse me, and um, and that it's important that you have the resources to do it, especially the black people on this call, the indigenous people on this call, the women, the queer people. Like you're 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 unicorns, and and particularly the black people. Like I'm, that stat, less than one percent of farmland in this country is owned by black people. So if you're a black person on this call who owns land, you are more than an anomaly. You are more than a unicorn. You have survived so much. You can teach so much to the rest of us. And I think that you need to be who we are championing as like the rest of us deserve what, what y'all have and, and y'all deserve the resources. So we got to get there and we're not going to get there under Trump. <laughs> so thank y'all so much. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. If I didn't get to you, I would love to like stay connected. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat real quick. So please reach out um, if there's ever a way that um, we can stay connected and I can continue to support the individual or collective work you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing space. Yeah, thank you, Bria. Do you have any other talks coming up or things that we should look out for to tune into in the future? Yeah, actually, um, I will be doing a few different talks. I'll be anyone who's in the New York area. I'll be doing a, um, a live event at Center for Fiction, um, and that will also be live streamed. Um, I'll also be at the Texas Book Festival if anyone here is in the Austin area. That's in November. Um, I post all of these things on my Instagram at Freckled While Black. I'll drop that in the chat real quick, um, but would love to stay connected to y'all. And yeah, join one, so of those, one of those live streams. Yeah, y'all gotta get a copy of the book. And um, if if this was any if this was anyone's like first time engaging with young farmers, reach out to your organizer or your local chapter, and let's talk more about getting involved and in, and in starting to do some of this this advocacy work with working with what we got, regardless of what it is. Um, grateful for everything that everyone's doing, putting energy into this work and energy into the places you are. So thank you and thank you, Bria. Thank you. Thank y'all.